Our next um, presenter is a really special and also a longtime friend of the Cox Center and of myself personally. It's Don Ferenz, who is the executive director of the Planethood Foundation, an expert um, in international criminal law, and he's got a big project on the crime of aggression. And the Planethood Foundation sponsored a really awesome essay contest. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, and thanks to all of you for being here. I would just like to take a moment just to set the stage about what this essay contest was all about. Mike took us back 25 years. Many of you in this audience will know that if we go back 70 years, we will see the Nuremberg trials were being held. My dad was a prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials. Uh, these were subsequent proceedings put on by the Americans after the first four, four power trial. And my dad opened his case saying the case we present is a plea of humanity to law. Some of you in this room will know that today the tables are slightly turned. We have the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. We have amendments on the crime of aggression, trying to help that court activate its jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, which was hailed at Nuremberg as the supreme international crime. And the reason I say that today the tables are turned, at Nuremberg they had a plea of humanity to law. The Rome Statute represents a plea of law to humanity. All of the world to get behind the Rome Statute and the International Criminal Court system and to support it. And I just want to begin by saying that in 1946, Harry Truman, as president, stood before the General Assembly, it was after the Nuremberg Judgment, and he said that 23 members of the United Nations have already bound themselves by the law of the Nuremberg Charter and Judgment, which says that planning or waging an aggressive war, and this is his language, is, quote, a crime against humanity for which leaders will be brought before the bar of international justice. So with that in mind as the backdrop, this essay was intended to pose the question, if you undertake an illegal use of force, can you be shielded by what is referred to very commonly as the laws and customs of war? In other words, if you kill people according to the customs of war, can you get off scot-free even if the incursion itself, the military intervention itself is illegal? So that's what the essay was about. And uh, we had uh, quite a few entries, 137 entries from over 50 countries. They were anonymously graded and ranked in terms of priority by several judges who are here with us today. David Crane, former chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. Dave, would you raise your hand? Um, James Johnson, former president of the Robert Jackson Center and chief trial attorney in the Charles Taylor trial. I know you're here someplace. Paul Williams, president of PILPG. Uh, Milena Stereo, associate dean of Cleveland Marshall College of Law. I'm not sure if she's with us this morning. She may have teaching duties. And Michael Scharf, co-dean, who you know. I, I know, of course, the people in the audience have not read the essays. They will be published. Um, but I want to share a little snippet written in 1758 by a Swiss jurist by the name of Emmerich de Vattel. And I think if we had been running this contest in 1758, we may have had him submit this submission. I'm going to read you just a little bit. It's a paragraph. He talks about the ruler who takes his nation into what he calls an unjust war. Today, we'd say an illegal war in violation of the UN Charter, meaning it's not authorized by the Security Council or in self-defense after an attack. Here's what he said. He said, whoever, therefore, takes up arms without a lawful cause can absolutely have no right whatever. Every act of hostility that he commits is an act of injustice. He says he's chargeable with all the evils, all the horrors of the war. The effusion of blood, the desolation of families, the rape and the acts of violence, the ravages, the conflagrations are his works and his crimes. He's guilty of a crime against the enemy who he attacks, oppresses and massacres without cause. He is guilty of a crime against his people, whom he forces into acts of injustice and exposes to danger without reason or necessity. Against those of his subjects who are ruined or distressed by the war, who lose their lives, their property, or their health in consequence of it. Finally, he is guilty of a, of a crime against mankind in general, whose peace he disturbs and to whom he sets a pernicious example. And now for our winners. The first place was a, an award of $10,000 in cash, which goes to Rachel E. Van Landingham. 
of Southwestern Law School, Associate Professor of Law. The second place, which is a $2,500 award, is to Thomas Harris, a student at the University of Maastricht. The third place is shared between three co-authors. It is also a prize of $2,500. Between Harrison Mbori Otieno, who is at the University of Nairobi, Kenya, Emma Wabuki, also from the University of Nairobi in Kenya, and Smith Otieno, also at the University of Nairobi. So great congratulations to the three of them, and best of luck in their future careers as well. It is really great to be uh, moderating, or perhaps at best a referee, of the last panel. And uh, they saved the best of la for last, of course. And I'd like to very quickly introduce our esteemed experts. Of course, we have Beth Van Schack starting at the end. And uh, Beth, of course, comes to us from Stanford Law School. And uh, before that, she was, of course, Ambassador Rapp's deputy. We have Leila Sadat coming to us from Washington University, from the Whitney R. Harris World Law Institute. We have, of course, David Crane, Director of Practice at Syracuse Law School, the first prosecutor at the Special Court for Sierra Leone. I have had the pleasure of knowing David Crane for over 30 years. And uh, what, what's that make, about nine or 10 when we first met, Dave? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, we, of course, have Maggie de Guzman here joining us from Temple Law School. And uh, someone you met earlier today, Don Ferenz. Please take a look at their full bios in your package of materials. And uh, again, it's, it's my pleasure just to be up here on the stage with them. Uh, you know, it's really great when you're having a panel and the substance of your panel is introduced by the keynote speaker that we had today. It's really terrific that Ambassador Rapp came up here. And, and what's even better is that now this panel gets to critique everything he said this morning, and he has no right to rebuttal. And so that's just what we're going to do. This is a critique of the Obama's administration, the administration's approach to the ICC and international criminal law. I'd like to jump right into uh, some gripes that I have with the Obama administration, a very specific one. Uh, some of you heard me say this morning something about the crime of aggression. Nuremberg trials were held. Robert Jackson, the American prosecutor and the American government, made sure that these Nuremberg trials went on and were held as trials. Stalin and, uh, and uh, Churchill would have been very happy to not have a rule of law, but rather take out the top uh, Nazi high command and murder them. That's what they wanted to do. The Americans insisted on a rule of law. They wanted to set a precedent for the future. They wanted to take mankind forward toward a rule of law. Uh, when that trial was done, Robert Jackson wrote to the President of the United States, and he said some very interesting words. He said, no one can hereafter deny, no one can hereafter deny or fail to know that the principles on which the Nazi leaders are judged to forfeit their lives constitute law and law with a sanction. He's writing to the President of the United States, 1946, October. Do we have law with a sanction today relative to the crime of aggression? This is a question that's being bandied about right now. The International Criminal Court member states met in the summer of 2010. They were working to give the court, at long last, active jurisdiction over acts of criminal aggression. And who do you think standing in the way of it, trying to stop it? The United States. I gave a talk in Denver Law School a couple of years ago, the crime of aggression, who's trying to kill it and why. And we know why the United States is trying to kill it. There was what was referred to as a major policy speech on the crime of aggression, and I'm quoting from Beth von Scott, who wrote a little piece on it after the American Society of International Law's annual meeting this year. There was a statement by an undersecretary, Sarah Sewell, at the US Department of State, and she said, the reason we are concerned from the US point of view with the crime of aggression being activated before the International Criminal Court, and let me remind you what the crime of aggression is. It is an act 
of military, typically, use of force not sanctioned by the UN Charter. That means not authorized by the Security Council and not in self-defense. The United States went on record saying, we're concerned that when we want to use force in violation of the face of the UN Charter, that our military partners, our coalition partners, they may be, quote, chilled by having a definition of the crime of aggression in the statute. Well, isn't that the whole point? For those that are going to take the law into their own hands like vigilantes, shouldn't there be a chilling effect of the rule of law to make them stop and ask like Tony Blair should have done with the invasion of Iraq? Maybe some of you have heard the story. He asked his, his generals, wanted a legal opinion, saying, is this legal, what we're doing? Lord Goldsmith wrote an opinion, said, no, it's not legal. Tony Blair said, that's not the opinion I want. And there's still a Chilcot inquiry going on today in the UK. So the US has gone on record saying, this will have a chilling effect on our treaty partners because it's too uncertain. Now they said some other things as well, but I wanna share something with you in this room. At least you'll know a little something about what's really going on behind the scenes. This business about giving the International Criminal Court jurisdiction over the crime of aggression was so watered down in Kampala at this review conference in 2010, that in fact, every country that is a member of the Assembly of States Parties, the International Criminal Court, they can, by signing a piece of paper, opt completely out of the court's jurisdiction. There's a reason I want to tell you about this. It's not because I want to be picky and pedantic. The United States statement at the American Society of International Law said to anyone who was listening, we don't want this to have a chilling effect because the definition is so uncertain that they're afraid they might be caught up in something that would be deemed illegal by the court. And yet, all of these partners of ours could opt out if they wanted to sign a piece of paper saying, we're not covered by the court's jurisdiction on aggression at all. So where's the big chilling effect if they can get a complete get out of jail free pass? I'll tell you what I think is really happening in between the lines. The British are members of the court. If the US asks them to engage in a coalition activity again, like Iraq in 2003, they have a choice. They either join and maybe be subject to the court's jurisdiction on the crime of aggression, or they opt out. Does the UK, a coalition partner of the United States, want to publicly go on record as saying we are opting out of the court's jurisdiction? Who would opt out of the court's jurisdiction other than somebody who was afraid they were breaking the law? comment about this issue about the United States regaining the moral high ground a little bit. Um, in some respects, it's actually a good thing that the United States is not a party to the Rome Statute. And I'll tell you why I say that. Because in some areas of the world, the ICC is considered to be white man's Western justice, a tool of colonial imperialism. And I know that myself because I've been at conferences with the Pan-Arab League where they looked at the representatives from the ICC and said, you want us to join this club? First, enforce all the resolutions against Israel, then come talk to us about equal justice. If you go to the US Supreme Court, you see four words etched in stone, equal justice under law. If we're going to cherry pick as a country, we're going to look like we're cherry picking as a country. Arbitrary enforcement of law is not considered the standard to which we aspire. But having said that, there's something I think we can do in the United States to regain the high ground. For example, we've gone on record publicly criticizing the definition of the crime of aggression as being uncertain. What we could do to show some moral leadership would be to say, we're going to put, coming back to your comment, Dave, into our domestic legislation, a better version of the crime of aggression so that American citizens will know that America does not condone illegal acts on a mass or on a large scale, large enough to constitute an act of aggression by American leaders, and we want to send that signal out to the world. That perhaps sounds like a big step in some respects and maybe a small step in others, but it would be a step in the right direction. In terms of the moral high ground, you know, you just heard from Beth that with respect to crime of torture, we do countenance universal jurisdiction in the United States, meaning that we can prosecute. 
We have had reports that there has been torture committed with the assent of the U.S. government. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but that's my impression from what little I've read overseas. I live in the U.K. Um, I think it's time for the United States to really grapple with do we mean what we say when we say that we will not countenance torture. Uh, and if we're going to apply universal jurisdiction rules and we think that others should, we need to set an example. 